I thank you all. I tell you, looking over Ryan's shoulder there, and all of his music on the phone, and uh, we use our iPhones for so much, and even scripture. So, would you open your Bible to Romans 11? Romans chapter 11, and if that's on your iPhone or iPad or laptop or whatever, it's great to see each of you here this morning. And one of the things that I would like us to do today as we enter this Christmas season is to finish Romans 11. So I'm not going to take three years on Romans 11. I'm going to take 30 minutes. And you're going to have the highlights, and you're going to understand exactly what Scripture is teaching, and we're not going to get in the weeds. So I want want you to look at this as the beginning of our Christmas season, and uh, then next week we'll come back and we'll look at the incarnation of Jesus. Uh, You know, the incarnation and the resurrection are the two major doctrines for a postmodern culture. And we have to get those right. We have to make those clear to those outside or or they won't understand. Everything else is not necessarily less important, but it is those two doctrines that speak to the generation in which we live in terms of an apologetic for our Christian faith. So as we think through that, we'll look then at Anna, Anna and Simeon, Anna and Simeon, not Annas, but Anna and Simeon the next week. And then the 24th, we've got a wonderful, wonderful Calvary Family Christmas service planned. And uh, bring your friends, and uh, we'll let the children lead us in the lighting of the Advent and incorporate as many different age groups in our congregation as we have. But today, in Romans 11, I think the best way for me to introduce this It's to say to you, I worship a Jew. Jesus was a Jew. And each of us who worship him must understand that we do worship a Jew, and we're told how throughout Scripture to worship him. And he talks about worship, true worship is in spirit and in truth, and there's nowhere in Scripture that it gives a lot of methods. And if you study, I know one Sunday school class studied music, and Lance and I didn't uh, um, conspire on today, but if you look at the history of worship uh, in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament in the Christian church down through history, you'll discover that there have been various methods, various tunes, various ways all through history to worship. Now, I would encourage some of you that uh, want to go a little deeper and look at things uh, from a more biblical standpoint, uh, whether it be music, whether it be preaching or doctrines or whatever, that you really hone in on historical theology. It's important to understand what the early church fathers taught because there are doctrines today that were never heard of in the early centuries of the church. And we're talking about the evangelical church. If you really want to know about the Reformation, and you should know about the Reformation, you really need to study what happened with those guys prior to the Revelation. John Wycliffe, uh, whose ministry led to the giving of the Bible in our language. John Huss, who was martyred at the stake for affirming the authority of Scripture and basically a free church. Now, all down through our Christian century, it's not been just Gentiles, but we all together worship Jesus who came through the lineage of David. Now, in chapter 11 and verse 1, let me read these, and I want us to look at God's remnant today and why the remnant is important, why the doctrine of the remnant is important to us. And he says, we read the scripture just a moment ago, so I'll not read it, but I want to pick up at verse 7, where he says, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. In other words, Paul is telling us there is a difference between 
between national Israel, national Judaism, and we've seen that in former messages in Romans 9, 10, and 11, as well as Romans 8, that even in the early days of the nation uh, with Jacob and all of his 12 sons, there was a believing remnant who believed and trusted by faith, and they were the people of God. And then there were those that were nationalistic Jews. Those were waiting for the Messiah from the standpoint of a military Messiah that would take them out of Rome's rule. And yet, there was that believing remnant, and you see it at the temple. We'll look at it in just a few weeks uh, with two people that were in the temple, Simeon and Anna. Faithful, faithful man and woman of God who were waiting for the consolation of Israel. We'll look at that in two weeks. But to get back to today, all down through history, Paul is beginning to point out the sovereignty of God. And that's the first thing the doctrine of the remnant teaches us is that God is sovereign. God planned our salvation from eternity past. And you say, well, I, I don't understand all of this stuff about election. Don't, don't get in the weeds on that. God in eternity past chose the Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world, be born of the virgin, live a sinless life, die on the cross for our sin, which is unbelief, and out of that root sin of unbelief, which was the sin of Adam and Eve, we have what we call sins. And it depends on what church you're in as to which sins are bad and which sins are good. You know, we sometimes major on the minors and minor on the majors, and it just depends on your background and where you came from. But... Jesus died for sin because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he took our sin, our unbelief, our rejection of God in his body on the cross. He was buried and three days later he rose from the dead and he's alive. And that is the demarcation of truth. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, that uh, the resurrection marks him out. In other words, the Greek word there is horizo, and it means horizon. It's where we get our word horizon. And it's the resurrection that marks Jesus out from every person, everything, every people that claim to have another God. Jesus is God who came in the flesh. We'll see that next week. And then we're in this age now that have called by theologians by different names, but ultimately Jesus, and only the Father knows when, said that he would return, and he will. And that's in the future, and some of us believe it's soon, and others may not care, and others may just wait and see what happens. But there's all kinds of debates about how that's going to happen or when that's going to happen. Let me put your heart at ease. Relax. It's in God's hand. You don't have to stress. You just have to be right. See, that's our role. We're, we're not on the Ways and Means Committee to determine how and when this happens. We're on the Preparation Committee to say to as many people as we can, come go with us, come go with us. And that's our assignment as the church in today's world. But all through that plan, God chose Jesus to do that. Jesus is the elect one of God, according to Isaiah chapter 42, 1, and there is no salvation apart from him. And the whole of the New Testament points back to Jesus in whom, by whom, through whom, for whom we find our salvation. So God is sovereign in election. God is sovereign in choice because he initiates. And it's interesting that we don't always know everything. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. And Elijah became depressed 1 Kings 19 is a great chapter. If you're in depression or you face that, let me encourage what the angel encouraged in God's prescription for Elijah. One, get some sleep. Rest. Eat a good meal. And go exercise. I'm serious. That's what he told Elijah. He fed him. He gave him water. He told him to rest. Elijah's sitting under a broom tree. He's complaining. He's scared to death of Jezebel because she's after his life. 
and she was capable of taking his life. And uh, they just had a great spiritual high in, in which God had shown himself to be God. And the 850 prophets of Baal and prophets of the grove had been slaughtered and destroyed. And Jezebel was after Elijah. And Elijah sitting under that broom tree, worn out, discouraged. A low after a spiritual high. And he cries out and he says, I'm the only one. What? I'm the only one left. God looks at him and he says, No, I've got 7,000 men who haven't bowed to Baal. That's the remnant. That's the remnant. It's a small majority. There's a remnant in Israel today. I think I may have erred. I don't remember exactly, and I haven't had time to go back and listen to the video, but I mentioned 150 Christians in Israel in some context last week, and uh, that, that was an error. There is by profession 185,000 Christians, and these include Catholics, they include Coptics, they include Evangelicals, they include everything that would go under the name of Christian, and the statistics are interesting. But it is that conservative Christian church that teaches you must be born again, that it's against the law for them to proselytize even in Israel today. It's not against the law to be a Christian. It's against the law to tell somebody else about Jesus unless they ask. And that's how our Texas Baptist men are able to share with people in Israel today is they ask. Now, I don't know how they do that, and uh, we'll have uh, a guest from Texas Baptist men with us in January, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about those kinds of things then. But uh, right now, just suffice it to say, it happens. Did you know that the majority of Christians in Israel are Palestinian? They're not Jews, they're Palestinians. And so here's a remnant that God has, and what God is teaching us in these first few verses of Romans 11, the high view, the 30,000-foot view, is the doctrine of the remnant affirms the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign in all things. And then I want you to notice in the latter part of this, uh, when you start in verse 11, there is the doctrine of the remnant affirms salvation is by grace alone. That's what Paul is teaching. He's writing to these Romans, largely a Gentile church, but there were some Jewish people in there. And he says in verse 11, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their future means riches for the Gentile, failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? And then he says, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Now, keep in mind, in verse 1, he asks the rhetorical question, has God rejected his people? And his answer is no, God has not rejected the Jews. Christ is not a rejection of the Jews. It's not a rejection of Israel. They can be included and they are in the remnant in those who believe and believe by faith. And here in verses 11 and through 24, he's talking about uh, some of the branches in verse 17 were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in? That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So don't become proud, but fear. 
If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note that the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again." For if you were cut from what by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? What is he talking about there? He's he's saying God can do it both ways. God is sovereign. We've learned that. And then we learned that the doctrine of the remnant affirms salvation by grace through faith alone. That was true in the Old Testament. For the ancient Jewish nation, those who believed, that believing remnant, the people of God, were always those who believed God and stepped out on what God had commanded or promised and acted on it. And the rest, in unbelief, shied away from what God said and walked their own direction. And yet God's faithfulness and promise to the nation is still true. Because the gifts and callings of God are not with with revocation. He doesn't take them back. But he's telling us the process here. And, And so there are now salvation open to both Jew and Gentile. And we'll see that in just a moment. But first I want you to see something. And I know that some of you are going to struggle with this. But it's good for you to struggle. And it's good for you to read wider than your favorite authors that agree with you. If the only people you read are the people that agree with you, your preconceived ideas, you are not learning. You're just piling up what you already know. Somebody joked about the seminary PhD and said it just means piled higher and deeper. So some of you have got PhDs in what you already know. You know? So you, you need to stretch a little bit. You need to step out just a little bit and listen in John chapter 15. Jesus, Scripture interprets Scripture. And i got to be honest with you. When I was preparing for this, knowing the plethora of end-time beliefs that are in any Baptist congregation, and this one is no exception to that, and knowing that I pastor everybody and I've got a responsibility to teach you truth, I struggle with that. This has not been an easy week of sermon preparation. So I go to the commentaries written by the covenant theologians, and they have their way. I go to the commentaries written by the dispensational theologians, and they have their way. I go to the commentators, uh, old commentaries that were more post-millennial, and they've got their way. And I then remembered what Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great British pastor, said The Bible sheds a lot of light on the commentaries. So I go back to the Bible. And Scripture often interprets itself, and Scripture in text also must be Scripture in context. And in the context of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, in chapter 15, Jesus says of John's gospel, I am the true vine. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. And so he continues that theme. But what we see in that, in the Old Testament, Israel was referred to as the vine. Now, I believe that was believing Israel. I believe that was the part of Israel that trusted and believed and were the people of God in the Old Testament and coming all the way down to Jesus and into the New Testament because God's plan has not changed. He didn't have plan A in the Old Testament and the Jews rejected, so he chose plan B, Jesus. That did not happen. Jesus has been God's plan all the way through. And so the church has not replaced Israel. That replacement theology, I believe, is in error. But what has replaced nationalism is Jesus. He said, I'm the vine. I'm everything that God was doing with this nation. I'm the vine. That's Jesus. 
And so in the Old Testament, we look forward and we see Jesus, the believing remnant, was expecting the Messiah. They were looking for him. Annas and Simeon were there and, and had been, Simeon had been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he saw the consolation of Israel. And we'll look at that. I keep getting ahead of myself. It's so rich. And that's Jesus. And so here in this passage, Paul is teaching us that no, God did not reject Israel. Yes, God has a plan for Israel. He did not reject Israel. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that God promised to Israel. In fact, he is Israel, and here he is the vine and the branches. And Paul is looking at we who are Gentiles and said, you know, you were not originally the people of God. But you were grafted in through faith. When you trusted Jesus, you and I were grafted in just like the Jew of the first century or the Gentile of the first century. The Gentile was grafted in to that branch as part of the people of God. And the fantastic thing that God is promising through this is that somewhere out here in the end time when, and it, it says, uh, talks about uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, somewhere there will be a last Gentile that will give his heart to Jesus, and then God is going to bring back far more Israelites to faith. They've been hardened. Now, when you look at that word hardened, that's a hard thing for us to accept. God hardens hearts, yes. There's no example in the Bible where God hardens someone's heart that he did not first give them ample opportunity to believe. But there comes a time when he hardens the heart. Now, the reason I know that is those verbs in this chapter are not in the passive tense of the Greek language, they're in the active tense. Passive would mean that I reject, I reject, I reject, I harden my own heart. Active means God does it. And so right now, in part, and I think... What we see in modern day uh, global situation, there are Messianic Jews, there are many, many, many uh, Jewish people have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And they trust Him and they live for Him. So they're hardened in part. But there's coming a time, and I don't know this is exactly the way it's going to happen, it's the way I understand that it could happen, most likely would happen, is there will be a revival among the, Israel, the Jewish people globally and a massive turning to faith in Christ. Now, some of you have got that all figured out as to when and how and everything like that, and I understand that, and some of you are going, huh? <laughs> you know, it, it's just I'm just going to live and do my stuff, and when it happens, it happens. But that's the promise here is, number one, God is sovereign. The doctrine of the remnant teaches that. Secondly, the doctrine of the remnant teaches us that salvation is by the grace of God. To each and every one of us, no human being saves themselves. It is by grace through faith. When we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, something happens inside of us. Our life is transformed. We'll see that in Romans 12. And then the thing that just sort of nails it, that I love it here, uh, the, the branch is really an interesting doctrine and, and really nice to look at and, and see throughout Scripture. But the remnant affirms the mystery of God to be revealed. And I want you to look at this in verses 25 and following because uh, I will conclude with this point. But he says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Some translations say this secret. You know, it's interesting. One of my favorite Old Testament verses is Deuteronomy 29, 29. That the secret things belong to God, but the things He's revealed belong to us. 
And this is one of the secret things, the mystery that was held for a long time. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. It is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That part has already happened with Jesus at the cross. We're not reverting back to Old Testament sacrifices. We're not reverting back to Old Testament Judaism. Why in the world would God send His Son to die on the cross and be raised from the dead and call Him the way, the truth, and the life, and all of a sudden out there somewhere in history say, oops, we're going back. No, 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 no. No, no, no. This is always forward. This is always forward as God gives revelation after revelation after revelation. And part of the revelation that he's given is in Ephesians. And you have to compare Ephesians and Romans and Galatians. They're just three books that sort of float around because Paul's the theologian in all of them. And listen to what he says in chapter 2. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision By what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You know what that word commonwealth means. The British commonwealth talks about it. Uh, it, What it means is not what it actually is in experience. In human experience, it means certain people rule the rest of us. But in the reality of the word, combine them together, common wealth. All of us have in common the wealth of the kingdom. And Paul is saying that at one time you Gentiles were alienated from the wealth of the kingdom of God in Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off had been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so he goes down, I'm skipping to verse 15. He abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that every time you read your English Bible and you see the word that, it's a word of purpose. It's a word of purpose. It's going to give you why he just said what he just said that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. In the first century, the Jew and the Gentile hated one another with a passion. Paul is telling us in Romans 11 that there's coming a day when There will be grafted back into the remnant those many unbelieving Jews. And how that's going to happen, I believe, in revival, in an end-time revival. But uh, that's, that's how I understand it and others understand it differently. And none of us are heretics. We're all seeking to understand the Word of God. But I want you to let me read in chapter 3. When Paul is talking about it. He said, I, Paul, prisoner of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it now has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is what he's talking about in Romans 11. It's what he's talking about in Ephesians 3. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Every one of us Gentiles ought to jump up and down and say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God created a people called for His name, named Israel. Down through the years, many of them were unbelieving, many were believing, and and he's he's grafted in all non-Jews who will come to Christ. So salvation is by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jew and the Gentile get saved the same way. And we're one people now. 
the middle wall of partition has been broken down. And everywhere in the world where there is a believing Jewish remnant, they and the Christian Gentile church are one. All over the globe. All over the globe. You say, well, how's this thing going to end? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I won't jump over a lot of dates and things and charts and stuff like that. I'll tell you what we've got to look forward to. Somewhere out there in God's future, Revelation 7 and verse 9. And if you want to understand Revelation, don't try to do it linearly, linear. Don't do that. Don't make every symbol, every metaphor stand up on its all fours. But you look at it through the lens of what John saw. After this, I saw. After this, I saw. After this, I saw. You look at it through that lens. And in verse 9, he says, after this, I looked. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's what we've got to look forward to. When people we've never met, people we don't know, because God is sovereign in His elective purposes. The doctrine of the remnant confirms that. The doctrine of the remnant confirms that salvation has been, is, and always will be by the grace of God given us when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the secret of God is that in Christ, Jew and Gentile are brought together in one people, the people of God. Now, is your heart hardened or have you opened it to receive the Lord Jesus Christ? Would you bow your head with me? While our team comes and we bow in prayer, let me ask you to know the Lord Jesus. You believe your conscience, your heart is pure before Him, and you're walking with Him now. Would you just pray during this time? And for others, I want to ask you a question. This is the invitation, and we're going to sing in just a moment, but this, this is part of the invitation, our invitation for you to come to Jesus. For you today to give your life to Jesus, to settle that. And for you to become part of this church if God is leading you to be a member of Calvary Baptist Church. When you come into our church, you become one of us. And I would say very clearly, if you've got baggage from somewhere else, please resolve that first. If you have questions about the church, happy to sit down and talk with you. But if you're coming as a believer, coming to serve, coming to be a part of what God is doing in this church, we welcome you. We welcome you. So right where you said, if you've never trusted Christ, and you will right now, just open your life and in your own words, just say something like, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross was buried and raised from the dead. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I trust you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead and I will confess Jesus is Lord. 